So today, a couple of things. Um, first is to define transformations. Very broadly in the north, on the south of the west. Um, <clears throat> I then want to talk about examples of quantum transformations. Um, copies, we'll talk about them in what I mentioned in the copy space. Um, and I'll give you some examples of our platform control field theories. Well, most likely you've seen it already. And then I want to do an example in um, an empire. It's more um, difficult to do than it is in an empire, but it can illustrate the point that I want. Okay, so by way of um, reminder, where I left off last time was to tell you that formal transformations are angular filters. So, given some vector space, I have um, two vectors. Those two vectors form uh, an angle between these two vectors. I make a quarter transformation. If the quarter transformation preserves the angle between those two vectors, then we'll call it a conformal transformation. So, you've seen this already actually in uh, the first course. Uh, in combat analysis, certainly in my uh, progress analysis course. Um, and in fact, quite a lot of what we've um, done in, um, in combat analysis will carry through to this because really we're going to be focusing a lot um, in two dimensions, right? And there, the conformal transformations, which are a set of holomorphic transformations in complex way, are exactly the set of conformal transformations that we've talked about. So, um, I think today is that all the transformations are angle preserving transformations. So, if you recall, given two vectors, um, x and y, the angle between those two vectors I compute as x dot y divided by 1x over 1 over 1. The magnitude of x times the magnitude of x. So this is how we calculate um, uh, the angle between the two vectors, and it comes from the definition of the top right between the two vectors. More generally, by more generally, I mean in a higher dimensions or in some curved space, um, I define, I can generalize the idea of uh, a dot product and then use that to determine. What quantity remains in there? So let me just take one step back. We're talking about the form transformations. So the idea is we want to make a change of coordinates that will affect these vectors, and this combination of the vectors remains invariant under the form transformations. Okay, so I, theta remains invariant, but if theta remains invariant, cos theta remains invariant. So really what we care about is this quantity on the right hand side. Okay. So more generally.
defiled. In two vectors in some e dimensional space that follow. So, where would you normally say an x star time? Why this quantity goes to the quantity x mu, g mu, y mu? Where each guy the x and y are vectors in some e dimensional space. We're used to calling uh, e vectors. And this quantity here is a beautiful the metric on the d dimension space. So it tells me a lot of kinds of things. Um, in the dimensional space. <laughs> and similarly, the length of the vector, um, which we normally call one x like this, becomes um, the quantity square root of x in g in Okay, so I know how to generalize the dot product between two vectors, and I know how to generalize the length of a vector. So the quantity that remains um, invariant is x in 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 y u over square root of x in v mu u and let's say x alpha d alpha beta uh, y and x beta Y tau V tau sigma Y sigma. Okay. So this quantity is the quantity that we would look at to determine whether we're talking about a form of conservation. In other words, I have some space of extra space uh, in which the extra and y I make an order transformation of the vector space. And I look at this quantity here and I ask, does that quantum transformation leave that quantity invariant? If it leaves that quantity invariant, then that quantum transformation is a formal quantum. Okay. Now, there is one thing that um, I would like to propose as an alternative definition. Okay. And that comes from noting the following. So I would like you to note that um, if I change the metric in this space, remember the metric is the thing that's telling me how to measure distances and angles in this space. If I change the metric in this space by rescaling it, then this quantity is also be varied under the rescaling metric from G to Lambda, lambda could possibly depend on the coordinate x, um, lambda squared. So, this is what we would call a local rescaling. So, it depends on where the space time you are. Um, but if I take the metric and I rescale the metric or multiply the metric by this positive factor, right, then this quantity remains invariant. In other words, this is a conformal transformation or well, turning it around. Conformal transformation induce a rescaling of the metric. So, a conformal transformation that we will take as a quarter transformation that induces a quantity local rescaling. Of the Uh, 
the coordinate of the measurements x mean to x tilde mean that induced a possibly local scaling measure. Which you mean general the function of coordinates in space time goes to number squared. What we also a function of the coordinates in space time times the mean. I'll do some examples in which we will um, identify. What the lambda is. So I have a question. And my question is um, why lambda square? So these questions will pop up. Um, as we go along, and therefore, if you think about um, and possibly do some small calculation to convince yourself of the fact, uh, and those questions that I think will lend themselves to some uh, deeper insight, I will pose as tutorial models, okay, exercises. But first, let's see if we can get a handle on what these problem observations are. I'd like to try and identify for you some step, not claiming that the set is exhaustive, but not claiming that it's a full set of performance automations. We'll get to that in a little bit. But I'd like to identify some performance automations um, that you may already be familiar with. And to do this, we're going to go to four directions in Koski space. Um, so, R one point three with metric theta mu. I think the biggest problem with the scale is that everybody uses different signature methods. Okay, so I'm going to use the real theory signature metric, which I think the entry is for theta mu to be probably minus. Um, you can choose the value metric in which the signature is, uh, in which the, the entry is in this uh, eta d on two plus. There are some minus signs that go around, and then we to keep track of those. It's fine. And I might also say between the two, but I'll make it clear when I'm going to do one. All right. Um, so we're going to take uh, the metric on Minkowski space to be. The diagonal matrix, the diagonal four by four matrix, uh, with entries plus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. Um, for those of you who are doing cosmology at the same time, good luck. Um, <clears throat> there's one thing cosmologists are good at it's uh, picking the other side matrix. So, I'm assuming that you might have done at least. I don't, I'm not taking for granted that it was done. There was a meeting here of the I will tell you, but I'm assuming that everybody has at least seen special relativity, right? So at least the day it was special relativity or you know, the magnetism you have seen. If you were forced special relativity, you would know that there are certain transformations, quantum transformations in. Array um, transformations. So the Minkowski metric, that is a meaning that we're talking about. There is a very kind of the primary transformations 
and they take the following form. And x medium to x tilde medium, and x tilde medium should be written as a lambda medium, this medium plus some a new. The set of matrices that are in you are Lorentz transformations. And the A mu are constant uh, D vectors, uh, in this case, four vectors, that code space time translations. So basically, not constant translation in space time. Right? So these are space time translations. So, operate translations then are made up of. Boost the Lorentz boost plus rotations. And both of these together are coded in the lambda mu news. These are what we will call Lorentz transformations. And space of time translations. Okay. <clears throat> Since Ponderay transformations leave the metric a variant, in other words, they send e to the mu determining to eat that code of mu, which is equal to the mu. They are trivially the formal transformations with the, the scaling lambda equals one. Question is in four dimensional Minkowski space, are there any less trivial where I have some non trivial lambdas to what's the answer to plus f? But to unpack these, let's consider the following. So instead of doing from very much measure of coordinates, let's rescale the coordinates. So just a normal scaling of coordinates. Right, so consider the scaling. So for something less trivial, so that the scale is not I'm going to go x mu under which x mu goes to x mu to the and x mu to the <coughs> will just be lambda times x mu. In this case, I'm going to consider lambda to be some constant. Let's ask what happens to the metric under this value. Let's 
So under this transformation, our metric eta b and e. Uh, in fact, let's consider the line element c s squared to eta b and e, dx e, dx e. This thing goes to eta new new tilde dx new tilde dx new tilde. These guys I can relate to the dx news and dx news by chain rule. Let me just eta tilde new dx. Uh, tilde b by dx. dx mu tilde by dx alpha dx mu tilde by dx theta dx alpha dx Taking the derivative of these guys, just pulled out a lambda with a chronic delta that matches the indices. So this is eta tilde in uh, you lambda. I get one lambda from here, one lambda from here. So it's good back from lambda. And then I get a delta in alpha from here, and a delta near. Beta from here, dx alpha, dx beta, which is just um, lambda squared times beta tilde mu nu, dx mu, dx mu. In other words, comparing this one and this, eta tilde is lambda to the minus two times eta. Where this lambda is a constant. Again, we made a we made a coordinate transformation, and this coordinate transformation has induced a scaling of the metric. In other words, scaling transformation, plain old multiplying by coordinates all by coordinates by the same constant number is a conformal transformation. There are a couple of points to note about this particular um, story that I'm building. There are points to what we follow. First is that scaling transformations have not left the metric invariant. In other words, they're not in the same set as contrary transformations. Okay, there's something else. So scaling. Um, not proper that they do not leave the metric invariant. The second point to note is that we should be talking about relativistic theories. Uh, we should talk about relativistic things. That's because we've been working with this line invariant as the line element, which is necessarily a relativistic thing. In the non-relativistic setting, we'll separate out space and time. 
you know, we will scale them differently. But in a non relativistic setting, um, we will scale space and time differently. The scale of x to lambda x, as we've described so far, and times scale as lambda to some power z times time. But this power z is what depends better. Theorists, this is called dynamical critical exponent. The dynamical critical it's an important role in the theory of phase bonding. And we'll talk about this now. But the point I'd like to make here is that you know particle physicists are trying to use the string theory to care about the relativistic setting. Here can it's better physicists, most of what you do in the lab has to do with non-relativistic setting. Okay, so condensed matter people tend to care mostly about unless you work in gravity, but condensed matter people tend to care mostly about non-relativistic things. And indeed, the theory of conformal transformations and uh, non-relativistic conformal transformations um, is uh, very much an open area of, of um, current research. And the thing that we understand about mathematically, that we understand about conformal transformations, um, is mostly to do with this relativistic um, setting, because that is the key here. In the non-relativistic setting, um, when you have these example critical components, um, things become a little more tricky to, to work out. So indeed, um, this is a um, sort of current uh, research. <clears throat> One more point that needs to be made is that momentum, so what we've done here is we rescale the position variables. Momentum variables scale um, with, the, with the negative power of, of lambda. And that's because the combination in x times p um, is something that occurs in a dimensionless way. And so, to make sure that the dimensions are correct, momentum needs to scale like 1 over x. Okay, so the momentum. Mm -hmm. goes to lambda. The minus one in here so that the combination of x and p is um is dimensionless and then that will be I know Americans think that the interior system is natural units, but it's not. I mean, h bar equals c equals a equals uh, anything else that can be called one. Okay. All right. So, what I've done here is I've given you two examples of formal transformations in four dimensional problems. Concrete transformations, so the right transformations plus boost, are conformal transformations. They angle to the lead symmetric invariance. Scaling of your coordinates, just multiplying all coordinates by the same positive number, is a conformal transformation. Right. We scale the metric from each other to lambda to minus one, uh, to minus two, um, theta. But boundary transformations and scaling transformations do not exhaust the set of conformal transformations in the cosmos. To understand, though, what the rest of the conformal transformations are. Um, and 
particular to identify what the group of observations were, the full group of observations are. We need a little bit more um, mathematical machinery, and then we'll circle back to this uh, to this question. First off, I want to give some examples of classical and formal field theories. Now, all of the examples that I'm going to give, all but one, I guess, um, you should be familiar with, at least having heard the words. Um, we're going to unpack some of these, um, and we're going to be focusing in particular on one of them. Uh, but for now, I just want to give a perspective <laughs> overview of um, what this look like. For example, the one for classical. All field theories in the dimensional health space. The first thing everybody's familiar with is Maxwell's equation of action. This is the statement that e mu f and mu, sorry, e mu f and mu was zero. Okay, where f and mu is the Faraday tensor, which for those of you who did by the fact that the exam, that the only three is how know enough. Second example um, of a um, the formal field theory in four dimensional impossible space is a three year equation. It's a statement that a spinner can, well, this is not really relevant, think of it as a square root of a vector, um, that gamma mu, d mu, d mu of psi um, is zero. So this is what we call a Dirac spinner. These are there are definitely the cheese. Um, think of these as a generalization of the part of the minimum and one other of the same quantum mechanics, and they satisfy. Um, for the Clifford algebra, is that the action common figure of gamma mu the gamma mu is um, two eta mu. Okay, that same eta mu nu that is the metric common. Um, Another example is four dimensional on the angle equation. Generalization um, to a non abelian case of the Maxwell equation. So this looks like the F A U mu is equal to some coupling constant uh, sorry, plus some coupling constant G times F A B C um A B mu 
test with that speed maybe mean equal zero. So this here is the Daniels coupling. I'm stopping over repeated indices, whether they be upstairs or downstairs. Which aspect are you? Oh, it right, just uh, well, yeah, it feels different from okay. It feels wrong when they wait walk upstairs. Yeah, yeah. So I just put it over the sum over. Answer. Um, this will actually put a sum outside there for what the systems will be that feels better. Okay, the angle of couple constant. This is what's called um, the structure constants. And this is the gauge field. Forming some gauge group and it's transformed in a particular way. Um, and these are our constants called the algebra of that transformation. Um, and these are the Faraday tensors associated to um, this gauge field here, which comes from taking an axisymmetric variable or two plus some common data. Okay. Again, um, we will possibly come back to uh, this in some more detail. Um, and then finally, I want to add um, to this list all the math lists on to the whole theory, which has a great deal of motion. Um, e e e R equal to uh, minus and the factorial by two. It's called five or four theory because um, if you write down the Lagrangian, it's okay that it's this theory that you find the four and then you find a little bit of that in the part of the ground equations, and that's how you find theories. And there's a distinction to be made between these theories. So let's make some notes about what it is that they are talking about. The first part to note is that. Well, okay, so all of these theories, my claim is that they're all formal field theories. They're field theories because they are theories of some continuous object that's changing in space and time. Um, and they're conformal because um, they satisfy the definition that we're going to give for what a formal field is. Um, for a formal field is. So these are examples, at least three of them you should. Be familiar with, which have be seen in the uh, works. I think it's probably not familiar with um, is this guy. Specifically, you should think of this as a, as a mathematical field theory. You might have seen it in the context of mathematical physics and solvents and some particular solutions. I don't really care about the solutions, I care about the overall structure of the theory. The third point to note in this is that the third field theory is Maxwell equations in the vacuum and the free theory equations. I want to call three theories. They're conformal because they don't interact. Okay. The second two theories, they are interacting theories. Right. This term here is what makes this different from um, actual theory. This is an interaction, self interaction between the gauge field and itself. Right. 
make it a highly contributed in the wire check decades. You saw all the results in at least a couple of other factors um, for people that did so. Okay. <clears throat> this theory here has a non vanishing vertex. The non vanishing vertex has also tells me that it is an interactive, self interactive thing. Okay. These two are performed because they're not interactive. These two are performed not because they're not interactive, but because all of the couplings in this theory, the angles coupling again, the lambda here, are dimensionless. Right? So these couplings are dimensionless. Um, uh, and it is precisely this that makes the theory perform. Okay? This is just an overview of, of these ideas um, for now. We're going to go into them in much more detail and you'll see why dimensionless couplings mean the same thing as angles of certain maps. So, I very carefully chose to make a statement about the equals four because this is very specifically a dimension dependent state. Okay, theories that are performed in one dimension not necessarily perform in the other dimension, other dimensions, because these couplings are no longer dimensionless. So the statement that these couplings are dimensionless is a dimensional statement. Second point I want to note is that I'm also being very careful about saying that these are classical field theories. I'm not talking about quantum field theories at this point. Okay, these are classical field theories. You solve them for phi or a or psi, as you would any other differential equation. You write down a set of differential equations, solve the differential equation for some um, some function of the x mu. Okay. <laughs> When you quantize the theory in quantum mechanics, there's a natural idea that um, this leads to what's called a running coupling. So these couplings change as you quantize the theory, right? Precisely these quantities. So I want to say that these guys are like mentioned this classical theory, and then I try to quantize the theory. A running of the couplings induces a length scale in the problem or mass scale in the problem. Right, some energy scale um, in, the, in the problem. And this energy scale, mass scale, breaks this classical control and variance of the problem. This is a very important point, you know. It leads to what I call control anomalies. Right? The theory of control anomalies is a very, very interesting, very rich, both mathematically and physically, um, uh, piece of, of physics that we all get to this. Um, so, quantum quantum mechanics leads to the running of things.
which leads to a um, induced scale. Scale the problem, which leads to broken uh, formal variance. So let me make one statement. There are three ways of breaking symptoms. The formal invariance is a symmetry of the theory of the formal conservation. So I make a formal conservation, something stays invariant or changes in a particular way, and I claim that this is the formal conservation. The same with Lorentz conservation, then Galilean conservation. So if I have a symmetry in the system, I make some change to the system, and the system is invariant in some particular way, then I say that this is a symmetry. Right? Symmetries are either broken or unbroken. If the symmetry is unbroken, um, then I'm in the symmetric phase. If the symmetry is broken, then I'm in broken symmetric phase. There are three ways to break the symmetry. One is there are explicit terms in the equation of motion, in the Lagrangian, that break the symmetry. Right? So that if I make the transformation, that term does not do what all the other terms are doing. Okay? That's all explicit breaking of the symmetry. Then there's what's called a spontaneous breaking of the symmetry. And a spontaneous breaking of the symmetry is when the theory on the whole, like for example, the Lagrangian of 5 form theory, has a particular symmetry, but you solve the theory for its lowest energy state, its lowest energy configuration, <laughs> and that lowest energy configuration does not obey the same symmetry. Okay, can I worry your pen for a second about this? Right. So here, here's, here's the pen. Yeah. Now, principal pen is not, um, it should, should be marked. Imagine there's no marking this pen, right? So if I put the pen down here and I rotate it about the vertical axis, okay, and I ask you to close your eyes and I make a rotation, now you open your eyes, if the pen's not marked, you're unable to tell that I made a rotation. So there's symmetry about the, the, the vertical axis, okay? Um, and this is what we would call it one symmetry. It's the same symmetry that Maxwell equation for that means. Now, if I let go of the pen, it'll fall to its lowest energy state. Okay. Now, if I try to do the same rotation about the same vertical axis, right, you can tell that I've made a rotation of this. So I've broken that new one symmetry. It's no longer present. The theory itself has a new one symmetry. It still has a new one symmetry, but its lowest energy state does not. Okay. This is what's called a spontaneous breaking of symmetry. And it is what leads to things like the Higgs mechanism and the Higgs field, etc. There is one more type of um, symmetry breaking that you can do, which is called anomalous breaking of symmetry. This is when you have a classical theory that has a certain symmetry, and when you quantize that theory, that symmetry is broken by a quantum equivalent of that theory. That results in what are called anomalies. Not only can either be local anomalies or local anomalies. One of them um, means that your theory is inherently sick in fix it in some way. Um, and it was essentially what led to the first string revolution, um, which we might touch on when we get to the knowledge. Um, and the other one is actually a really deep piece of mathematics. Okay. Um, so, again, I can have a classical theory with a particular symmetry, and when I quantize that symmetry, that classical symmetry gets broken. Okay, that will result in um, in anomalies, <laughs> and it's called anomalous breaking. So this is what happens with this the, the um, scaling terms. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so this is just to give you an idea of um, some of the things that you probably already know about. Um, <clears throat> But phrasing them in a slightly different way. There are two examples, there are two further examples that I want to do um, to talk about the problem field theories. Um, one comes from problem, sorry, from condensed matter physics, and the other one, which we'll spend a little bit of time on, um, is really the simplest 
conformal field theory that you come up with, which is a conformal field theory in zero space dimensions at one time dimension, and with this conformal quantum mechanics. Okay, so it's going to look like quantum mechanics succeed, and it's going to get a question that's on the body, but it's going to look slightly um, different. Okay, it's going to have negative thousand of the field, and I'm going to show you that it's preserved the conformal symmetry that um, we can talk about. But first, I want to just talk a little bit about um, uh, some condensed matter. So, the reason why condensed matter should be um, care about all the field theories at all, you know, if they were not non relativistic um, field theories, is because um, critical points of condensed matter systems are described by the formal field theories. So let me show you what a critical point is, um, and we will get to some example of the CFTs that they describe, uh, or that I'm describing um, uh, in a little bit. So a critical point in statistical physics is a point at the end of a, of a um, phase equilibrium curve at which some phase transition takes place. So for example, in water, there is a liquid gas phase transition. In the phase space of the of, uh, water, I will find a phase equilibrium um, curve. At the end of that phase equilibrium curve, I will find a critical point. Critical points are described by the formal field theories. A critical point in statistical physics. Is uh, a point at the end of the phase equilibrium curve Um, at the phase transition of this. And critical points So again, one example of a also critical point is liquid gas um transition in water. Or, for example, um, the Curie point um, for magnets. Right? So, I don't know, you know, but if you take a magnet and you heat up at some temperature, it stops being magnetic. Right? But it stops being magnetic um, at the Curie temperature um, because of some of the interesting predictors that I'm going to tell you about this time. But the best place, probably the best example that illustrates both of these phase transitions is a rice cooker. Um, the physics of rice cookers is absolutely spectacular. It's super simple, um, but it's a really, really interesting piece of physics. And kudos to the engineers at the end of But rice cookers actually utilize both of these transitions the liquid gas transition, as well as the Curie point where uh, magnets demagnetize to um, <clears throat> not burn your rice. Right, so the question is, how does the right look and how it start? Okay, and the answer is, it uses the fact that when you 
have a liquid gas condition in, in water, and then when the water becomes water vapor, um, at 100 degrees Celsius, liquid water, modulo in a very special circumstances, liquid water cannot exist. Right? So if I take liquid water and I heat it up at 100 degrees Celsius, it will vaporize. Um, I can keep pumping energy into that system, and all it's doing is it's using that energy to convert the liquid into vapor. Right? The water itself, the liquid water, is not increasing above 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so the temperature remains fixed at 100 degrees Celsius, but the energy that you pump into the system, uh, the price of the pumps into the system, is used to convert liquid water into vapor. Okay, so here's the kicker. Rice doesn't have to obey this, this, this story. So the rice itself can increase above 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so once all the water has either been absorbed by the rice, converted into vapor, and then absorbed by the rice, um, the rice will start to heat up beyond 100 degrees Celsius. Right? The switch in a um, in the rice cooker, it's controlled by a magnet, right? So the, the magnet basically holds the, the switch together. So once the temperature increases beyond the 100 degrees Celsius, uh, at least to the purity point of the specific magnet that's, that's used, it demagnetizes to break the switch, and the rice cooker is switched off. Okay, so there's nothing else that you learn in this course of the computer. <laughs> You now understand the method that I was All right, so let me stop there. And um, I will talk a little bit more about critical exponents and we'll start conformal quantum mechanics next time.